So uh, thank you for coming to my Munchkin talk. Uh, contact Nate afterwards for uh, a small donut. Um, I'll be talking uh, about uh, one of the first sessions of Popple, Automated Verification, coming up this morning. I'll also be chairing the session, so I hope to see you there. Um, there are three papers in the session, but I want to start by kind of situating what I think this session is kind of about. Um, so uh, in PL, I don't mean broadly, but in PL, uh, we do a lot of formal work, and we do it kind of on a spectrum. So on the one hand, you have this sort of like careful experts one-off work, right? like the master, the master craftsman uh, at their workbench. Um, uh, and then on the other spectrum, you have fully automated work. Right? Which is, it, just, like, it just happens. Right? It's like the, the tool just does what you want. Now, of course, this is like, there's a big spectrum of this. Nothing really exists on just one side or the other. And it's not like one is sort of like more important than the other. On some level, like manual work is primary because like, look, you know, where did the, the first assemblers and compilers come from? Like humans come first in science. But like at this point, both are doing, you know, stuff all the time. And they exist with each other, right? So the expert will use automated tools, right? You know, an assembler or a compiler we don't think of as an automated tool, but it's actually doing incredible work. Um, and at the same time, automated work will depend on experts to exist. Right, so it'll get made by someone doing manual work. So it's not like this is just like, oh, this automated is good and not automated. It's like you can't have one without the other. But anyway, in this talk, we are talking about sort of the fully automated uh, setting, the space communism setting. So um, there's a bunch of things I want to highlight about. This is the Jetsons, which is a classic American cartoon uh, about sort of a potential future utopia um, where people seemingly still have like bosses and have to work, but then also live in weird space pods. There's a lot going on. Um, but the thing I wanted to stress is that, well, in this, the, one of the things that's great about automation uh, is its sense of like scale and luxury. So what, what automation does is it lets experts extend their reach off far, far away. Right? So it's like rather than having a single expert butler, they have Rosie the robot made, and presumably everybody else in their little luxury space pods have their own robot butlers. Right, and this is sort of like, well, whoever figured out how to make robot butlers has now made butlers for everybody, and notionally they're all going to have better lives for it. It's like you don't want to investigate like the premises of the Jetsons too much because it gets pretty weird, uh, but this is sort of the general idea. Right? This is one of the things that automation does for you is it lets you scale your expertise up. There are, of course, other ways to do that, but automation is a great way to do it because you just distribute the program, and now you're cooking. This is not without problems. So in PL, we're often... Um, uh, you know, in the gizmo business, where the gizmo is either a tool that gives you answers about things, like this is a good program or a bad program, or, you know, it's an actual gizmo, right? Here is a new program, right, for synthesis or a compiler. And in PL, we often want to know something about these gizmos. We want to know that, you know, principally, we want to know they're, they're correct. We didn't mess up too badly. Um, so that's going to involve some form of proof where it'll say, well, the answer is correct, or, you know, this gizmo functions according to gizmo specification 1.3. Like, you give, you give, like, whatever your spec is, and then we do the right thing. Um, so this is the sort of thing we do. Um, automation uh, makes this problem worse because, well, you're not actually talking about just a gizmo anymore. You're talking about the gizmo making gizmo. So now you're in this sort of land of higher order proof. Right? It's like, well, hey, my gizmo making robot will guaranteedly produce gizmos that have some property. Or when I give an answer, that answer has some, you know, some proof notionally backing up. Right? If my static analysis say that a variable can point to uh, some memory location, then like, well, no, that really is a thing that could happen in the program. So that's, that's, that's harder, right? Like the, the, it's sort of ironic that automatic verification comes with this incredibly hard property that you need about your automatic verification tool to know that you got it right. So sort of like ironically, you need um, a bunch more of that. OK, the last common thread here is that everything is concurrent. So uh, that'll be interesting for them. Uh, it's a nightmare. It's just very hard. OK, so there's three papers. I'm going to talk about them each very, very briefly. Um, the first is this tool, Cater, which is about memory models. So I expect we'll actually hear more about memory models in the, um, in the keynote, but the gist of it is this. Uh, you know, it can happen at, the, at a CPU level or at a higher programming language level. You have a bunch of cores on a CPU, and they need to talk to each other. So like, they're going to be reading from and writing to each other. And the memory model sort of tells you what can be observed, you know, how, what's allowed to happen. Um, uh, if you are using concurrency, you either are using a memory model or really should be uh, because your book one exists and it is telling you what can happen and you may not know it. Uh, they're very hard, right? It's like very easy. Like they give, they give these out of thin air examples. Like every time I've tried to interact with these artifacts, it's just like really mind bending. So it's like it's hard to answer questions about individual programs. It's hard to relate programs to each other. It's hard to relate memory models to other memory models. Like I don't understand how people do any of the work in this area. Uh, so like kudos to them, and uh, that's that's wonderful. In this paper, um, the the way they're sort of making it tractable, and they're doing this sort of very high level reasoning about memory models in the abstract. Um, their trick is to use uh, some amazing regular expression technology. So it's sort of Stephen Colclini uh, got his operator's license, and he's going to help them out. 
Uh, uh, the idea is that a cat is like a good fit for the kinds of relational operators that are used to define memory models. Uh, and this is like, if you have not yet heard the good news, cat is sound, complete, and decidable. So that means there's like efficient decision procedures for facts about cat, and that's very exciting. Um, uh, here they're going to interpret cat as sort of a set of execution graphs and they do a bunch of cool things with that. Um, so they'll talk about it more um, in the talk. Some highlights are that they're able to uh, redetect a known bug in a naive compilation of C11 to PowerPC, so that's cool. And then more interesting to me as somebody who's stoked about cat, uh, they're able to define a bunch of cool new queries. Right? There's relational operators they're interested in that they're able to sort of learn things about uh, using cat's equational theory. So it's like always cool when you find sort of new things you can do with cat because it sort of extends uh, its reach. So this should be a cool paper. The next paper, uh, Stratified Commutativity in Verification algorithm, Algorithms for Concurrent Programs, um, uh, is, another, is another cool one. I should note this one will be uh, given virtually. Uh, so as I said, concurrency is very challenging. There's sort of a little too much going on. But so if you want to prove something about a concurrent program, that means you need to prove something about all possible interleavings. And it turns out once you have more than like four or five things that could happen, that, that's a lot. Right? So sort of, there's this huge explosion. Um, so uh, one strategy people have deployed here is to use commutativity to sort of just like lower the number of interleavings they have to consider. If two operations commute, you don't have to consider you know, swapping them. You just pick a canonical order, and now your life is marginally easier. All right. So one of the insights of this paper is that, well, there's the concrete notion of commutativity. I used to live in LA. I sort of know about this, though I got to walk to work. Um, and what their observation is that this concrete commutativity has lots of unnecessary detail. Right? If you have two programs or two operations in a program where there's like logging, that might break commutativity, even though like you don't actually care about log order at all. So like you want some other notion, right? Some some like more abstract notion of commutativity. So they come up with this like notion, well, well of abstract commutativity, specialized to the property being proved. And this sort of gives you a different notion of commutativity that's sort of like a little easier to work with. Now, naturally, you might wonder how can you reconcile abstraction and concrete commutativity. Um, this is Pete Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie, which is actually a painting of roads. I'm like doing my best here. Uh, so um, they give proof rules for how you combine these two things and sort of like show you that you can sort of like, uh, you can like work with it optimally. Then they have this like automatic, theor automatic theoretic uh, implementation of it uh, that will use these optimal usages of the commutativity relation and it, it's a prototype in the ultimate family of tools. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so last thing uh, in my remaining minute uh, is this partial overview of message passing communication models. This is a pretty theoretical paper, but it's a pretty cool one. Um, so there's lots of different communication models for how people talk about processes or distributed processes talking to each other. Uh, these are simpler than memory models because it's really just message sends. You don't have the read-write distinction. But like, it's like not that simple, uh, which should be very clear. Um, uh, the, a model for communication could be more or less synchronous. This, mo this paper covers seven different models for, uh, for communication, which is kind of incredible. Um, the one that they actually use, like their core model, is the, um, uh, oh, MSC, I just completely forgot what it stands for. But it's a, it's a partial order view of how these uh, message sequence charts, that's what they're called, uh, how they work. The idea is, like, you've probably seen these before, like, okay, you're online, you buy things, and then, like, people keep sending messages, but like, everyone could be talking to each other. Like, so, like, this is sort of like the, the OG, this is how you talk about communication, sort of graph theoretic. So, in this paper, uh, they come up with a hierarchy of these communication models axiomatized in MSO, monadic second order logic, uh, which is a great and friendly logic, which has like really nice properties. They have new undecidability results for synchroniz synchronizability in these different models. Um, and then lastly, they sort of point at, well, you can, with this graph theoretic approach, you can decompose uh, some of these message sequence charts and maybe do bounded model checking on some of the communication patterns here. So there could be some cool implementation stuff there. All right, uh, that is literally all the time that I have. I hope to see you in the session. Thank you for coming up here. Mike using the full 10 minutes for his session preview. Um, Sorry. We do have time for one question if someone has a, qu a question while Neil sets up. Wait, they're allowed to ask me questions? <laughs> <laughs> tried to run out the clock. But I think you're lucky that no one wants to ask a question. And I'll just say while Neil's setting up, um, so another um, uh, thing this, these session previews may help with is that Popple is now double tracked. So you can only go to one of the two talks uh, in person. You can, of course, watch the other talk uh, on AirMeter YouTube after the fact. Um, but you'll have to choose between uh, the automatic verification and the, and the types. <laughs> um, no, no, no.